here with Harry Stein today, who is founder and CEO of Stein Seed Company. Harry, I've heard of you referred to in multiple ways, entrepreneur, inventor, innovator, businessman, Forbes member. But when I bring groups here to introduce yourself, you usually just say that I'm a farmer. Correct. <laughs> and I think that's as good of a title as any. Um, so you, Harry, you've been a pioneer in seed genetics, which I think has played such a substantial role in um, agriculture and food and kind of the productivity of agriculture. Can you tell us about kind of your discovery that brought about the company that is here today? Well, on our traditional small farm here, which was 200 acres of rented ground, my father raised public released varieties. Incidentally, the, the, land, the USDA, Agricultural Research Service of the USDA, and in conjunction with the land grant university system, developed all of the self-pollinated crops back during this time frame. Mm -hmm. And the, in, in the case of Iowa, the Committee for Ag Development uh, would release then this new varieties to farmers in the area that had a record of growing certified seed. So we would get new varieties from the university um, of oats and soybeans and grow 30, 40 acres, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And we would clean them into a bin and then shovel them into our neighbor's wagons. And so to that extent, we were in the seed business. And then along came a, a new variety, <clears throat> happened to be Amsoy. Mm -hmm. which was much more productive than the ones before. And incidentally, that was developed by Dr. Weber at Iowa State University. Mm -hmm. And my father, incidentally, back up, when the standard planting rate for soybeans was a bushel and a peck. Mm -hmm. And there was a couple of different reasons for that. One was soybeans were larger then than they are today. Mm -hmm. So there really wasn't as many seeds there as you would think. And we had no herbicides of any description. So you had to plant them pretty thick uh, in order to keep the weeds down. Mm -hmm. And also, hypocaule elongation is a term you don't even hear about today anymore. But when we started soybean breeding at a certain temperature, which is about 75 degrees, about the soil temperature when you plant soybeans, uh, certain variety genetics would only elongate so far. Mm -hmm. And so in order to help break the crust and get those up, you needed to plant at a heavier rate. So there's all kinds of reasons why you needed to plant at a heavier rate. But my father said, oh, that was not necessary. You could plant at half rate and they would do fine. Well, right in a field out here, uh, when my father had planted soybeans, a couple of rows had plugged up just for a few feet, not very far. So he backed up, unplugged those rows, and then didn't want to bother, so he just double planted then the, the two rows for a distance there. And I combined those soybeans with a two row pool massy combine. And in the summer, I told him, I said, I'm sorry, Father, but you're messing up here because those doubled rows are way, way better than those other rows. And when I combined it with this two row massy combine, I came to those two rows and it was just a bunch of flimsy little stems <laughs> and not much soybeans there at all. So then I had to go back and tell him, you know, you were right. <laughs> Lots of plant, not many soybeans. Yes. So when we got this new variety of these new soybeans, we planted them at half rate. And they sold for double the price of soybeans at that time. And so I thought, my goodness, uh, being able to sell at double price was amazing. And if I had developed that variety, I would control all of it instead of just part of it. Uh, and could maybe even have a higher price. Mm -hmm. So that, I guess, triggered my interest uh, in moving in that direction. And then Walt Fair, who incidentally had just replaced uh, Dr. Weber mm -hmm. at Iowa State University, called together all of the certified seed producers and said, you know, if as a group they had a private program, they could move much faster than the university. They said the committees that have to meet there and approve budgets and what have you. And at the first meeting, there was probably, I don't know, 30 or 40 people there. And the next meeting, it was down to about a dozen. And finally then, three or four of us formed a plant breeding group. And so Walt Fair is really the basis for starting that group. Ah, well, 
kind of the nature of a land grant university, at least in how it should operate, right? It's trying yes. to motivate the private sector to get things done. So what did some of your early experiments with breeding look like? Well, in the beginning, uh, all we had were pods from bulk populations. So we planted those in what we called a hill plot pattern. One of the members of our group made a marker that would mark out an X on the ground and we would plant a few of these seeds in the center and on the four corners we would plant the balance of the seeds so that that variety was bordered by itself all the way around. And then depending on the quantity of seed that we had, we would plant more than one rep of that, mm -hmm. but not more probably than three reps. Mm -hmm. And in that first year, which I think was 76 or thereabouts, uh, we had about 5,000 entries. And entry 4,995 was a variety that we called Marshall and actually sold it through the Committee for Ag Development uh, to farmers. And back in those early days, yeah, intellectual property protection for open pollinated varieties didn't exist. And so when was it that you began to understand that some of those legal trends might support development of the business in addition to just doing good plant breeding? Well, and as you well know, there were no private plant breeding people at that time because mm -hmm. they were all smarter than we were. Mm -hmm. And after we got some varieties, oh, we've got a problem here, folks, because we have no way to protect our varieties. And it just so happened that I visited with a party who was working with people on the West Coast on green beans, edible green beans. Mm -hmm. And he said they used a contractual restrictions. So when they gave the seed to growers, uh, part of the agreement was that they wouldn't use it for breeding purposes or reproduction. So, oh, okay, then we can do that. Mm -hmm. So we started that practice several years before the patent office. The patent office would not accept applications for self-pollinated crops at that time. Mm -hmm. Certain things like trees that were propagated, propagated. vegetatively, mm -hmm. you could get a patent on, but you couldn't get a patent on something like soybeans. And that started about in the 1990s, I think. So back in the 80s, we were using our grower restriction licenses uh, to inhibit people. And as you can well imagine, it worked for the most part. You could also, you could always have some farmers that, that wouldn't follow the rules, but the majority did. So that worked reasonably well. Mm -hmm. So corn yields in the United States, and I looked up some historic information here, averaged around 26 bushels until the late 1930s. And so you said your dad came to this farm in the mid 1930s and started farming. Um, and that was sort of the advent era of hybrid seed corn. Today on a good farm in Dallas County where we sit today, a farmer's probably hoping for something like 10 times that 250 bushels per acre. Soybean yields haven't changed that much, but they have trended upward because of work that people like you do. Um, how do you think about what it's taken to increase productivity that much? And how do you think about further upside in yields for the different crops and how much more can be done and will be done? Well, most think people think genetics are about half of that increase. And the other half are the equipment that we use for both planting and harvesting, uh, the fungicides, the insecticides, the herbicides, that whole combination. And because of those things, we have earlier planting dates today than we did then. Mm -hmm. So we effectively get to use a longer growing season. So there's a number of things that have contributed to the increased yields. And incidentally, both corn and soybeans have increased. You see, soybeans at that time, in the beginning, were yielding about 20 bushels per acre. Mm -hmm. Well, today it's not unusual for a farmer to get 75 or 80. Mm -hmm. So even though the percentage is not as high as it is in corn, I think the actual increases maybe more than some people realize. Mm -hmm. um, but if you would have told my father, your kid will be able to get 10 times what the national average is today, 
I mean, that would be totally crazy. Nobody, nobody would, would think 10 times, maybe doubling maybe, but 10 times is just beyond imagination. So when we tell people today, well, we're going to double yields, they say, oh, you can't do that. <laughs> well, we, th we think you can, and we think the same old story. It'll be a combination of improved fungicides, improved insecticides, uh, as well as improved genetics. Mm -hmm. And we really think genetics are improving faster today uh, than they were many years ago. The late Don Dubik, who was the research director at Pioneer for a number of years, did a study when he retired, actually did it in conjunction with Iowa State University, okay. uh, and tested all the hybrids from the 1930s to the 1990s. And what he clearly showed was that the population increase during that same time frame and the yield increase were almost identical. So virtually all of the improved yield was coming from improved population. The ear size was virtually the same. Mm -hmm. So that told us that in the future, you needed to have higher population. Well, during this time frame of almost 100 years, most of the breeding people did not realize it was the population change. So they weren't trying to increase population and they almost did it by mistake. <laughs> uh, so once we saw the trend, which is totally due to Dubik's work, um, we started planting at higher populations and today we're getting higher yields. Uh, so essentially selecting for plants that do better in a higher population environment. Yes. And when we do that, it was interesting. I just had some people in here yesterday and we noted that our plants are a little shorter. Our leaves are up beside the tassel. I make jokes that we really don't have shorter corn. We just have lower tassels. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, you're almost right there. Um, and then the flowering. The old open pollinated varieties would actually shed pollen as much as two weeks ahead of silking. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. Well, what you really had then was hybrid seed corn. Mm -hmm. You see, when a plant couldn't pollinate itself, mm -hmm. it wasn't good hybrid, but it was hybrid. And, and incidentally, trees are that way too today. Uh, nut trees, fruit trees will frequently not have the male parts and the female parts flower at the same time. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, now that though we're into uh, monoculture and the kind of crops we raise today, we have actually moved so that our hybrids will silk a day or two ahead of pollen shed instead of two weeks late. Mm -hmm. So is it those sort of things that lead you to say that you think the improvements from plant breeding are actually accelerating? Yes, because people now recognize that pushing the population is the way to go. So they're doing that more and, and developing these very traits that I just talked about which you don't need to select for those traits. If you just select for high yield, mm -hmm. you will automatically go there. You'll get those traits, sure. What do you consider some of your most significant entrepreneurial moments, which events, decisions, and people have most impacted your journey? Well, in 1997, we did a major collaborative agreement with Monsanto at that time, mm -hmm. Bayer today. Um, and that was very important for us and a significant move. Um, and one of the people that we really admire a lot was Henry Wallace. And the reason we admire him was when he was a boy, the story goes, uh, Iowa State University had a summer program. And so he wasn't out of high school yet. He was still in high school, but he went to this summer program that Iowa State College at that mm -hmm. time uh, had for corn. And in that part of that program was, remember this was all open pollinated corn. So they said, well, you save all the big ears. And so Henry said, well, why do you save the big ears? And the response was, well, everybody knows that's what you do. Well, where's the data? Well, of course there was no data. So in their backyard in Des Moines, he planted big ears, medium sized ears, and little snotty ears and found out there was no difference. You can see you can almost make a case that the little snotty ears might have more heterosis the next mm -hmm. generation mm -hmm. than, than the big ears. Mm -hmm. But we're always kind of contrarians. And so we respect people that went a different path, which is what we did a little bit. 
Yeah, I mean, starting a company when there was no intellectual property protection for doing soybeans. Um, yeah, deciding population, looking at data. Uh, how important is data from your perspective? Well, as you may know, I'm dyslexic and autistic. And so sometimes we see things a little backward and people think I'm joking, but I'm not. Almost everyone can do almost everything better than I can. But I think I can evaluate probability a little better, maybe. And so when you look at data, somebody will see data and here's a corn yield that jumps way up. You say, wow, we've got a new good hybrid. No, you have an error <laughs> in all probability <laughs> if it's too much above mm -hmm. the other means. So uh, we all have our advantages and disadvantages and we need to take advantage of our advantages. I remember having an event in, with three very successful entrepreneurs and I don't know how it came up, but each one of them was dyslexic. <laughs> hmm. All very successful. And so I teased them and said, you know, we, we tell entrepreneurs that they look at the world differently. Well, you do see the world differently <laughs> in how you process it. Uh, yes, I believe that's very true. And there's disadvantages to that. Sure. It, I'm probably slower at seeing and understanding things than the average person. But because you see it backwards and forwards, I think at the end of the day, there's an advantage to that. Mm -hmm. But it probably wasn't easy, at least in school, <laughs> you know, trying to figure out reading and basic things like that. I did not know I was dyslexic until my children came home from school. And they said, we've been diagnosed as being dyslexic. I said, I'd never heard of that word. I didn't know what that meant. And when they explained it to me, in retrospect, uh, and incidentally, I'm a boy and boys are a little slower and I have these limited traits. I started first grade when I was four years old. So <laughs> a first grade boy at four years old who's autistic and dyslexic. By the end of the year, I couldn't spell cat. Um, <laughs> But during the spring of the third grade, the teacher came back and grabbed me out of my seat and hugged me. So uh, what's going on here? I had gotten a perfect score on an arithmetic test. Okay. So at that point in time, I'd learned to reverse everything. Okay. Learned how to compensate for that by third grade. Very good. When you think about your work, are there any decision rules? that may have guided you explicitly or implicitly, you know, when you decide, Harry, to work on new things, maybe to drop old things, to make changes, to double down on something that you think is gonna work. Is there any sort of decision rules or ways that you can describe for our audience kind of how you make those decisions and what guides you? Well, we feel very strongly that you should not beat a dead horse. <laughs> We make lots of mistakes all the time. And there's nothing wrong with making mistakes because we learn from them. What's wrong is if you're dead set on making something work that won't work and you keep pouring your time and energy and money into it, that's what's wrong. So, and in all fairness, it's probably easier for an ownership entrepreneur to do that than somebody else. Because I can just say, okay, I made a mistake and move on. And nobody's going to fire me or complain about it. Uh. <laughs> yeah, but at uh, large companies, at least in my experience, and I've talked to others where it's the same, it's sort of one of these things where it's like, don't admit a mistake because <laughs> it's not good for the career. <laughs> and so you beat a dead horse or... Anyway, I think sort of how I think about it is you lose potentially the learning that comes from making mistakes. And that's, you know, asking what happened, why did it happen? So nobody will fire you, Harry. <laughs> but how do you, for people on your team here at the company, create a culture where making mistakes, as long as I'm sure they're within certain boundaries, is just part of the process? Well, making mistakes are okay. Not reporting it is not okay. Okay. <laughs> and we try to tell everyone in our system, you can come in my door any day you want to with an idea that's going to improve this company. 
and I may turn you down 16 times in a row. Don't let that inhibit you from coming through number 17. So we encourage everyone to, to give their ideas and, and there's nothing wrong with having a wrong idea that doesn't work. We even try, we constantly try things that don't work. Um, but at some point in time, you recognize, yes, we've, we've done everything we can with that idea and drop it and move on. Do you have any examples of decisions where the wrong principle or perhaps a lack of principle, you know, led to a decision uh, that maybe wasn't good or maybe where you had a principle that led to a decision that was hard at the time that actually led to a good outcome? I, I think, for example, as I've observed, Harry, you in making decisions about this business, you take a very long-term view. <laughs> and uh, that seems to be kind of one of the principles. But how do you think about principles and how you make, make decisions and what kind of guides your decisions? Well, most major companies do things by committee. We have a dictatorship here. Okay. <laughs> and anytime you have a committee together, there's always someone that's going to object to what they're doing. And so you get nothing done. And we get things done. They're frequently wrong, but we get things done. Um, but the closest thing, almost what you're relating to, in college, I had a course in economics. Uh oh. <laughs> and we had a pop quiz. And I didn't understand the quiz, and I didn't understand the concepts involved, so I got all the questions right. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, uh, because I had an A to start with, because that was right at the beginning of the course, well, that gave me incentive to work hard on it and, and learn what was in there. <laughs> Otherwise, I might not have, might have learned what I was supposed to. Uh, but that concept also applies to many business things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So how else do you think about the cultural values at your business in this, <laughs> uh, in this company? You know, oftentimes people in business will talk about the culture at, at their company, but how it happens, how it evolves is sometimes harder to put your finger on, but I'm, I'm looking at the sign behind us, Harry, and it says Stein values, you know, so that probably reflects culture. But how do you think about culture at your company? Well, sometimes over the years, I've had to work 24 hours straight. And part of our principle is we never ask anyone to do something that we wouldn't do or haven't done. And I think that's important. When the, when the people see me doing the things and particularly a decrepit old man, <laughs> doing, doing the things that they wouldn't expect, uh, I think they're able to contribute. And if there's the lazy, troublemaking type people, they don't stay in our system very long. And there's a guy in, down the other hall who I say works half time. He works six to six. <laughs> and then it's not unusual, he'll come in late on Sunday. And I give him heck when he comes in late on Sunday. But my, my point is many people here work well beyond what you would expect in most organizations. And, and I think a little bit of the reason is, is because they see the dedication that I have and, and they latch onto that. So where does your own dedication come for the business and interest in the business? When I was four years old and started school, when I would come home after school, I would pick up black walnuts and hull them and put them on the roof of a chicken house to let them dry. And my mother drove me to the Thriftway store in Perry and I sold 400 pounds for five cents a pound. So I think, and you've heard me say this before, that part of being an entrepreneur is genetic because obviously it started at that point in time and furthermore, I tell people I still have the $20 because it didn't occur to me to spend it. It wasn't that I thought, oh, Harry, you should be a good boy and save this. No, it didn't cross my mind. I just, the natural thing to do was put it in the bank. Uh, and maybe remember uh, my parents moved here during the depression and during drought years. So that conditioning 
And then furthermore, I was, I was born the week before Pearl Harbor. Well, that led to rationing. You couldn't get farm equipment. You couldn't get fuel. Uh, and maybe that conditioning contributed some, but I think it's a combination of conditioning and genetics. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, you've heard me ask people in your class, how many of you wanted to be a professional jockey or a professional baseball player? Well, none of them. Well, why not? Oh, we don't have the ability. Well, what makes you think you can be an entrepreneur? It's the same concept. Yeah, and so we've you've teased me plenty of times about this, but there's this old question in entrepreneurship, are entrepreneurs born or made? Where do you come down on that? I think you've already indicated it. But. Well, it's <laughs> mostly born. In, in all fair, well, I compare it to coaching. If you've never been coached in basketball, you probably aren't a good player. But if you've been coached to no end and you don't have athletic skills, you aren't going to be a good player. So it takes a combination, but having athletic skills is more important than, than the coaching. But coaching is important. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's helpful. So in all fairness, your classes on entrepreneurship can help someone that has the ability. If they don't have the ability, uh, it isn't going to help them very much. And what do you think entrepreneurs today need, needed to be coached most about? Well, I maintain that the most important thing is for someone to be doing something they like. If you don't like what you're doing, and I don't care if it's a regular job or you're an entrepreneur, it ain't going to work. Uh, if you love what you're doing, you talk about job burnout. If you love what you're doing, <laughs> there's no such thing as burnout. You just keep working on it. Yes. Uh, and so I, I love what I'm doing. It's the most fun thing I can imagine. Uh, and I think that's important for, for anyone. And even if they aren't highly successful, it's still important that they're doing something they enjoy. And I think that's a pretty big part of what I try to do in the entrepreneurship course is not necessarily to get the students to think of what their startup business idea should be, but just get a little bit closer to what do you care about <laughs> to that whole issue. When Was there a particular moment when you said, you know, this seed business, I'm having fun? No. Being a farmer, we, we always worry about the weather. We always worry about prices. And in doing the plant breeding, because we were taking a significantly different path you always worry, well, wait a minute, maybe we're wrong and going down the wrong path. And today I don't feel that way, but for many years I questioned that. Well, when you're doing something that nobody else is doing, and maybe some years it doesn't work well, I think that's probably a natural thing to think. Well, zooming back, you know, the seed business, in my observation at least, up until the 1990s was predominantly comprised of lots of family businesses. Pioneer perhaps being the exception of that, um, although the families, founding families, were still really involved with the business back then too. Today, not so much. You know, what's it like to be an independent family business in an industry that now has big multinational companies that occupy big parts of it? Well, there are quite a few still family seed businesses but they're really just truck drivers for the big companies. They, they deliver seed, but they, they raise it and pay the fees for both the genetics and the traits. And the margins are very, very slim when you're doing that. There are almost no significant plant breeding programs today with the exception of ours and the larger companies. And, and we lucked out starting at the point in time when we did because if we had to start over today, uh, the way germplasm is tied up and regulated, I don't think we could do it. Mm -hmm. But the point in time uh, that we started, it was relatively easy. Um, but part of the principles uh, that we adhere to is you can't do anything halfway. So if you're going to have a breeding program, it's a little rinky-dink program, I'm sorry it's never gonna result in anything. So volume and execution are, are highly important. Um, 
but as I said, the, the major companies have to have a committee meeting to decide when the committee is going to meet. And so we can blow by them fairly easily. Because occasionally I have people say, well, Harry, why are these companies paying you these fairly large amounts of sums of money? And I said, well, it's my warm, fuzzy personality, I think. <laughs> I don't know why else they would do that. Well, obviously, it's, it's because they need the genetics. Mm -hmm. And we think we can uh, develop genetics faster and better than they can. Yeah, when I'm coaching startup founders, you know, I try to coach them that the maybe one advantage you have compared to large companies that are competitors is that you can move faster. Now, you have to decide carefully what you work on and can move faster with. But you're a bigger company now and you still move faster. <laughs> well, we think so because, as I said, we have a dictatorship <laughs> and you can make decisions very quickly that way uh, compared to committees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in all fairness, uh, you can say that a committee system is better because you eliminate some mistakes. And we make some mistakes uh, that, a, that a committee might not make. But we think the speed makes up for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Harry, who are the entrepreneurs, past, present, that you admire? And what have you learned from other entrepreneurs or what do you take inspiration from? You mentioned Henry Wallace earlier as, as one that you paid attention to, the founder of Pioneer in 1926, I think, but who else? I don't know that there's any people in particular because some people have other family members that help them out, uh, brothers, sisters, cousins, whatever. And I never, ever had anyone. And, and I always kind of felt badly about that because I'm kind of hanging out here by myself pretty much. Um, In college, one of our, my ag professors had us make a farm plan. And you think, well, that's no big deal, right? Well, it was detailed. So you had to know when you were doing breeding animals, how much you were going to feed them, where you were going to get that feed, when you were going to sell them, so forth. But that taught me the details of organization. Mm -hmm. And so I credit that with being an, an important part. Uh, of learning to to manage to keep things organized. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a kind of Midwestern way of being an entrepreneur that might differ from other parts of the country, or is being an entrepreneur being an entrepreneur no matter where you're at? You know, you mentioned hard work as an important value to you, and here at that company, I think. <laughs> We still do a pretty good job in the middle part of the country at working hard, but what else might be different, if anything? I don't know that the concepts for business are radically different, but the actions of people are different. As you move east or west from the Midwest, one of my favorite stories is when we were dealing with a, actually a French company, um, on buying some assets, we agreed one day on the price and what we were buying. And the next day, he said, well, those things you were buying yesterday aren't here today. I said, wait a minute, we just agreed yesterday. Yeah, I know. So he didn't disagree that we'd agreed. He just said, so? They've changed their mind. Well, what's the use of trying to decide something today? <laughs> and, and so... The, the honesty and straightforwardness of people in the Midwest deteriorates as you go both east and west. And as you know, uh, in some countries, bribery and what have you is standard procedure and you almost can't function without it. So that's probably the different aspect. Uh, in, in the Midwest, I, I've got a calling card that somebody gave me that said, because I said I would. <laughs> and in the Midwest, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time that carries through. Uh, and it doesn't carry through uh, on either coast and or when you go off coast. Mm -hmm. Well, Harry, to conclude our conversation today, is there any other bits of advice you would like to offer up to aspiring entrepreneurs that might be listening or watching? 
I don't think so, other than I just mentioned, do something you like. Um, and nothing is more important than that. Well, Harry, as always, thank you for being generous with your time and for sharing your thoughts with another generation of entrepreneurs. Thank you.